This is going to be quite a long video, probably one of my longest that I've ever done on the channel. And I was going to cut it down. I was going to edit it down to like 10, 15 minutes, like the usual length that my videos are on my channel. But I wanted to share the entire story. Now, this is Berkshire Cycles that have just won the best UK independent dealer. Been in business for 43 years. And for the first year, they were nominated and won the best UK independent dealer, which is pretty significant, really. It's a really prestigious award. Anyway, I went in to see the team and spoke to them and I started trying to edit it down. And I thought, no, I'm just going to keep it as it is. So it's the raw 45 minute chat and then I speak to the team at the end of the video. So it is a super long video, more of like a, a podcast, video cast if you like. So um, listen to the team and listen to Chris and he tells some brilliant uh, stories of his time in the bike industry. So let's just uh, get straight into it. How's it been for you and your team and what's your experience been like? Cause for a lot of people they've been off work, furloughed, and it's almost been the opposite for the cycling industry. Uh, to be honest, it's obviously financially, it's been incredible. Mentally, it's been horrendous. You know, having queues of 20 to 30 people outside the door every minute of the day, you know, having to serve on the, on the path and only allowing four people in that need to look at bikes. And, you know, it was mad, honestly, we were doing you know, seven o'clock in the morning to 11 o'clock at night. We were literally going home, having a cereal, going to bed, getting up and coming to work. So we were all in our bubble. But yeah, in 43 years, never seen anything like it in my life. Really? Yeah. In terms of like the, the just the volume of customers. I mean, having, I guess the shops closed so people have to queue outside, but having that demand for, I remember rocking up a few times and, and seeing those queues outside. And what was it like with stock? Because I know not just e-bikes, but every bike, it seems, has kind of run out. We were lucky, really, because, you know, we had invested a lot of money into stock, which, you know, kept us going. But it was, it was just crazy times. You know, you're having people come in and you're saying, um, you know, the only one I've got is this one here and it's 700 quid and they're going, great, I'll have it. You know, I'll never forget one guy, he, he come in and he brought three bikes and I saw him pedalling up the hill. And I said to him, that, that bike's miles too small. He said, I hate cycling. I'm not going to be using it after this. He said, so I don't care. Just wanted a bike, basically. Just wanted a bike, yeah. We've got pictures where we were going out of here on a Saturday and there wasn't a bike left in the shop. It was just mad. And, you know, because our other shops were closed, we pulled all the staff over here. So we had about, you know, 16, 17 members of staff, but we had to split them up, you know, for social distancing. So we had some guys working upstairs. We had guys working in a turbo store. And, you know, they were just constantly building all the time just to try and get bikes in. And then, you know, we, got, we sort of got through the first lockdown and, uh, you know, we thought, right, you know, it's, we're going to get some form of normality back. And it just didn't, didn't stop. Um, we're ringing up all the manufacturers saying, look, you know, we're desperate, but of course, everyone's on the phone as well. So, you know, we're used to having, you know, I don't know, three, 400 bikes a week delivered. And we were having three or four bikes delivered and we were getting all excited, you know, because we had something. Yeah, it, the whole thing was just madness, absolute madness. Mm. But I'm glad that we were allowed to be open. You know, there's a lot of people out there that have really suffered through this and, you know, it, it, it's not a very nice time for them. But yeah, I think everyone in the bike trade, I think is, all those that are opened, I think everyone's been, you know, taking sort of like double the amount of money they would normally take. and. I think it saved a lot of companies as well. You know, there's, there was companies out there who were looking a little bit shaky. So uh, it's helped them, which is great. Hopefully, a lot of people have learned from this. You know, that, um, you know, if, you, if you're sailing close to the wind, you need to look at restructuring things and 
everyone's saying to me now, you need to buy, you need to buy, you need to buy. And I'm just saying, no, we're just, we just take it easy. We just go through as we're going through and just see where it goes from there. Because even though there's a shortage of everything at the moment, I think with Brexit, the docks are all full at the moment. So, you know, it's crazy times trying to get the containers unloaded. But um, for me, I'm taking a gamble on everything could be all right. We just do what we know that we do best. So. Fair fingers enough. crossed. Yeah, Fing fingers crossed. Mm. And it'll be interesting to see. I always ask you this question, but new bikes, I know you can't share stuff, but specialised, uh, in your own words, you'll say to me, they're always maybe years ahead of some of the competitors. W what can you share or what can't you share with us around new stuff? It's got to be coming soon. There's got to be some new e-bikes from Specialised coming soon. And There's obviously, you know, Specialised are pushing all the time. Um, the Levo, you know, <clears throat> is coming up for three years old. Um, so, yeah, I would imagine that, you know, 2021 is going to be an exciting time, not just for Spech, but for a lot of other brands as well. I think that, you know, everyone's starting to get the hang of it now. Um, you know, they're not looking like e-bikes anymore. So Specialiser, I think we're ahead with that. Now, you know, other manufacturers are getting close. And the, the, the big thing with an e-bike is the reliability. And, you know, obviously forums are brilliant. Yours is all right. Um, but they can, they can throw a bit of a spanner in the works. You know, you get people, you know, on the forums, a lot of them haven't got specialized bikes, but they've jumped on the bandwagon and, you know, Specialise have had a bit of bad press, and, and rightly so, because they have had their issues. But if you look at how many is sold, the percentage now, before I think, you know, two or 3% was sort of acceptable. I'd say now they're probably, I don't honestly know, but between eight and 10%. So it's not good at all. Eight, eight and 10% of what? Gone, gone faulty. Is that yeah, you know, percentage-wise of how many bikes are sold and, and the problems and bits and pieces. So it's really difficult because you you, you can't just walk downstairs and make a, a different component and stick it in the bike. You know, so for us, it's like we're always pushing. So why? Why is it failed? What we got to do? You know, how can we get round it? You know, we've been able to help with some of the fixes. You know, looking at different things and changing them, like back in the, you know with the first uh, Gen Levo. But demands are getting greater, A, for the bike and also for the reliability. And I still, you know, believe there isn't such a thing as a 100% reliable e-bike on the market at the moment. Um, but when you're selling more than pretty most any other manufacturer, the problems are going to be highlighted. But again, the frustrating thing is, is how quickly these bikes get sorted out and, and keep the customer on the, on the move. And that's, you know, what we... Are trying to do you know through lockdown it was it was just madness because all the shops were busy so that put more stress on them so when people were going back with their e-bike you know they're telling myself we can't look at it for at least two or three weeks in my eyes that's not acceptable well i've seen you take other shops bikes in for customers that have been told that i know of examples where customers have traveled from liverpool or you'll probably tell me further away than that. Scotland but. is, you know, one of the guys, you know, he said, like, how do I stand? And I said, well, you're allowed to, you know, uh, go out on your bike. And if we're the only person that can fix your, fix your bike, then, you know, so be it. And, you know, he travelled down and, you know, it was great, you, you know, meeting lovely, more lovely people. And, you know, I think the, the main thing, I think, is, you know, for mental health, Rob, you know, it's... I think a lot of people have found the second lockdown a lot, lot harder because we were really lucky. In the first lockdown, the weather was good. You know, everyone was sort of up for it because they hadn't had a, a holiday for a while and, you know, managed to spend time with the family and with the kids. And th th there's a lot of people that are going to come out of this and actually realise that life is about living, not just for working and, you know, spending quality time with the family. So. That's a plus that's come out of it. But mental health issue side of it, you know, even for us, you know, we, we literally were going home and going, wow, 
you know, what have we got to do to, you know, to try and make things easier for ourselves. And in the end, we just found out that, you know, we were trying too hard and we just sort of relaxed a little bit and then, yeah, just become the norm. Yeah, I think you've got to look after yourselves and your team. And I know, I know that you do that a lot. And I know the team are fantastic here and take great pride in being able to say yes to customers and really helping them out. And fixing someone's bike same day is kind of the norm for you guys. It's what you really strive to achieve when a customer brings their bike in. And I think for you, it's I always see you guys as how can you say yes to a customer instead of how can we not say yes. Do you know what I mean? You're always trying to look for reasons to be able to do it or fix it or get them going sooner rather than later. That's what you got to do, isn't it? You know, for me, you know, it's no secret that the batteries in the Specialized on the Gen 2 have been absolutely bulletproof. And then all of a sudden it's as if someone's flicked a switch and, you know, a lot of the 700 batteries were failing and, you know, it, and to us, we're going, well, that's crazy. We, we, you know, we've never had a, a 700 battery go down. But it just, it, it was, it's sort of consistent with the um, update on the software. So you're always looking, you know, is it something that they've done with the software and everything else? And we're, you know, we're sort of like in contact all the time trying to find out. We're thinking that it could be a batch of um, dodgy cells, but, that's why I always say to you, it's four steps forward and two steps backwards. So is that what you really want to see with a new bike? You know, some steps taken with that reliability aspect. I guess it means quite a big deal to, to you, your team and, and your customers. Well, it's a bit of a double-edged sword for us, isn't it? Because well, yeah, it is. if they build a bike that doesn't go wrong, people might not need to come here. So, you know, not that I, I don't want that. It's it, I think that everyone is looking to improve the reliability on the bikes. And I know that Specialized won't be just out there going, you know, we've had a bit of a rough time, we're gonna wear it again. How long do you test a bike for? You know, I would say that if there is something coming from Specialized, um, it, it's got to have been tried for at least a year or two you know, for the amount of <clears throat> problems that they've had, they've, you know, they fixed the issues with the, you know, the clutch, the belt and the, the shaft through the motor. But every time you fix something, it then highlights something else. And, you know, I would say that they'd be on it, Rob. Cool. I guess I also wanted to talk a lot about you guys, you, your shop, your history, because I want to say a massive congratulations because you were voted the best independent bike dealer in the UK this week, earlier this week, which I think is absolutely fantastic, mate. And you should be, well, I know you're super chuffed to bits and your team are so over the moon with it. And it's it's just that little bit of recognition that I think is is great for you to have. And it's voted by industry experts and, and customers so massive congratulations mate best bike dealer in the uk is is a pretty pretty significant achievement so well done thank you and um, we're not necessarily the best in the uk because if every shop had been entered or put forward for it it may be a different different story. But it was voted for by people. Anyone could nominate anybody, right? So yeah. I think that you maybe you're, you, you could have a case there, but in order to get into it, someone has to nominate you. And in order to be nominated, you have to have done something that is going to inspire a customer to want to do that, right? So if you've just been a shop that's been doing a, doing a good job or doing an okay job, but not really gone that extra mile is, do you deserve to be nominated, I guess? Yeah, but you know, we've, we've been around for 40 odd years and we've never been nominated. So, um, you know, we've had a couple of staff that have been here for a year and they say that it's because they're here. <laughs> um, so how, hold on, 43 years? 
44, actually, 44. is 6th of December just gone. So yeah. give us a brief history, because that's a significant amount. That's, that's longer than a lot of bike brands have been around. So how did it all start? Talk to me about the history of Berkshire Cycles and how you kind of grew to be the team that you are now and winning the best independent bike dealer in the UK and selling all these e-bikes. Where did it start? Well, I think in one of our chats before, I told you that it sort of basically started from us going to jumble sales and, you know, selling in Petticoat Lane and bits and pieces. But there was a family in, in Reading that owned probably the, the busiest bike shop in the country called the Wilkins family. We used to basically do second-hand bikes up and they would pretty much buy everything that we had. So <clears throat> my dad um, used to work nights at a foundry in Langley. And um, as a family, we all we were always quite close, and we used to mess about and you know have fun. And um, I can't remember what it was about 72, 73. Um, we were all messing about in the garden. We had a paddling pool and and, and so on. And uh, my mum is always the clown, so she sprayed my dad. He's gone chasing after her and she's run into the, into the house and slammed the door behind her. And it was uh, in the days before safety glass. And he slipped on the step and he put his hand up and ended up going through the, the glass door. And um, from where we lived in Woodley to the nearest hospital was probably about, about four or five miles, but it wasn't an A&E hospital. So uh, by the time he's got there, um, he'd lost seven pints of blood. And the reception said, look, you need to go on to the next hospital, which is about another three miles away. And luckily enough, there was a surgeon there that said this guy won't even make it down the steps. So they got hold of him, got him in, you know, put a load of blood into him. And, and uh, he'd cut, severed all his, his arteries and nerves and everything in his, uh, in his hand in his, or in, in his arm. And, uh, you know, back in the 70s, you know, nerve surgery was quite new and so on. So they managed to get sort of like three, three of his fingers working. His thumb was sort of working but didn't have any feeling. And then this finger here couldn't do anything with it. So he, he was always like this. So uh, it was a rough time, you know. He was, he was in the hospital for, I think, seven months. Um, you know, they thought that the only way they could, you know, do anything was maybe to remove the arm, but they, you know they all hung in there and they were fantastic. And he owes his life to them for sure. So uh, yeah, then he come out and it was one of those life changing moments. I think he, he you know he decided that he was going to um, open a little bike shop. And um, I remember them coming home and saying, you know, we've seen this little place in Crowthorne. I said, you know, where's Crowthorne? And uh, anyway, they, they, they brought us over and it was a little delicatessen and it was a bit of a mess, really. And uh, Dad turned around and said, well, you know, th this is it. This is, we, we've got to make this work and, and so on. So, you know, with him being out of action, you know, even my mum, you know, we were spraying bikes. We were, you know, getting a little bit of a stockpile going together. And um, yeah, December, I think it was December the 6th, 1976. We opened the shop, we had probably about 200 bikes, everything secondhand because we couldn't afford to have any new bikes. There was a, you know, already a cycle shop in Crowthorne that done motorbikes and, and, and bicycles. And because it's a little, little village, you know, everyone was saying, oh, they never last, you know, it's, you know, they're outsiders. Um, yeah, and it sort of started from there and, then we started getting, you know, queues because second-hand bikes is what people could afford. You know, I, I never forget, you know, the first day was just like we were all pumped. You Did know? you have a massive queue outside? No. No? No. We actually took £1.89. And I remember my mum's words to my dad to this day. And it was, if you think I'm standing in a shop all day to take £1.89, You've got another thing coming. <laughs> and Roy being Roy to him, I said, ah, you know, don't worry, you know, it can only get better and, and so on. And and it did. It was just crazy, you know. 
a bicycle back in the 70s and 80s was a massive Christmas present. So here it always used to be total chaos. You know, you'd have, without any exaggeration, between two to 3,000 bikes away. And it was like... Over the Christmas period. Over the Christmas period, yeah. yeah. And it was, we were literally, you know, your parents would come in and say, you know, Rob wants a rally chopper and he would like it orange. So we'd be painting bikes and getting everything. And we were literally saying to the people, you know, can you hold it by the grips in the saddle because the paint still isn't dry? It was, it was honestly absolute madness. And that's pretty much how it started. You know, no one would supply us. Um, and we didn't need it, to be fair. You know, we had the second-hand bikes and they were really going well. And then we had, um, I don't know if you remember, a company called Puck, P-U-C-H. It was imported in this country by a guy called John Moore, who owns Moore and & Large. And um, his rep come down and he said to my dad, he said, um, we are you selling a few bikes? And dad said, yeah, you know, we're, we're plodding along. And um, what they done is they, uh, they put 10 bikes into us and said, you know, when you've sold those 10 bikes, you know, give us a call, pay for them, and we'll let you have another 10. So the bikes were delivered on a Wednesday, and by Friday morning, we're on the phone saying, we need another 10. And, um, yeah, it all sort of kicked off from there. So we, it, it, we, we've been lucky because it, there, there's been some cracking people in the, in the trade that have, you know, looked after us over the years where, you know, they could see that we were trying and possibly, hopefully, going to move forward. And without their support, you know, we'd probably still be doing second-hand bikes. But. Wow. Well, what, what a change from opening on your first day to, what was it, £1.80's worth of, of trade to, you know, when a bike comes out or something happens, you're selling, from what I can see, a huge volume of, of, of e-bikes. Um, you mentioned your, your dad, Roy. Roy was his name. He was, was yeah, name. yeah, yeah. What, what do you think he would have thought of, you know, you winning this kind of best bike dealer in the UK? I th I'm sure he'd be very, very proud of you guys and, and you. Yeah, he was. You know, to be honest, we couldn't have done anything without him, you know. For a man that comes over from Ireland with a fiver in his pocket that he'd borrowed from a little man that repaired bikes in in a shed in Ireland, you know, um, I remember going back with him, you know, and he gave the guy twenty quid back. And that was his interest, and it was all quite funny. But no, if, if if you knew Roy, anyone that knows Roy would turn around and say that he was just the loveliest man that you could honestly meet. So genuine, never got caught up in, you know, who's bigger or how many we're selling. As long as he could, you know, go out to the Bernie and have a steak every Thursday night, he was happy. And, you know, and that's where we sort of got it from. You know, he'd probably be going mad now because the amount of electric we use in charge of <laughs> these bikes. <laughs> no, he, what, he, what do you think he would think of the e-bikes? Was, was he able to see this kind of new revolution come along? No, sadly not. He, he you know... Um, uh, about three months before he died, um, we we used to be very big on insurance replacement. So we got in, the, you know, in early with that, and uh, you know that was really really good for us. Um, and uh, about three months before he died, I just got a contract with Halfords to supply Halfords for the whole of the country for their insurance replacement. And uh, you know, he used to say to me, "Just be careful." You know, these big boys, just because they're big, don't necessarily mean that they got big bank accounts. You know, just keep an eye on it. And, um, yeah, we, we had the contract for about 13 years with them. And I just, you know, I'd love, you know, even if I've got every, give everything back, Rob, to be able to spend an hour with him and ask him, you know, do you think I've done all right? You know, how do you think we're going? You know, we're looking after mum. All that sort of stuff, really. But when I was racing the motorbikes, you know, I might have a bad race or probably had a, a load of bad races. And uh, he always used to come over and he'd say to me, have you tried your best? And I said, well, I did. I couldn't go any faster. He said, that's it. Leave it at that then. And he said, next week, 
we just got to try a bit harder. And, and that was him. As long as everyone was, you know, healthy and happy, that was Roy, he, he was content, you know. <clears throat> he always used to say, you know, people would turn around and say things like, well, I'm not a millionaire. And Roy would always turn around and say, I think you're a millionaire because you don't look like you have any ailments and, you know, you've made it through to this part of your life. So I think you're a multi-millionaire. And that's just how he was. Money didn't mean anything to him. You know, he used to be hilarious, Rob. You know, in the 80s, it was literally going back to the old Petticoat Lane days where, you know, someone was throwing in some saucepans and some towels to now the sow, you know. I remember one of the managers saying to Roy, you know, you, you've just lost money on that, Roy. And he turned around and said, yes, my money to lose. You keep making the money, I'll keep giving it away. <laughs> and that was just the way that he was. Brilliant. Mm. That's, that's an amazing story. Thanks for sharing. I see some of those kind of traits in you, though, the way that you, you are about yourself and the way that you are with your team and the way the team are with, with you. It seems like you've got a really nice work ethic and atmosphere. And from, from a person that's an outsider coming into the shop, everyone really wants to do a great job. And it, it looks like everyone works very, very hard, but it doesn't feel like it's super high pressure. And, you know, you always have banter with, with your team. And I, I guess that's been, you know, part of the, the, the success of, of the store and the growth of it. Everyone feeling like they're, they're kind of involved in the success. Well, they are. Because we've, you know, if it wasn't for them, we, we wouldn't have any success. You know, um, it's fantastic. You know, people messaging, texting. You know, well done, Chris. Well done, Chris. And back in 1976, you know, we were just this little family that had started a bike shop, and I was the sprog. You know, cleaning up, making the tea. You know, generally being a nuisance. You know, um, and we got some youngsters working for us that. You know, I can see me in them, you know. So I'm forever shouting at them and giving them a clip round the ear like I used to get. Um, but you, you spend so much time at work. And one thing that I've learned from was that at one stage we had 14 shops. You know, I think Dad got a little bit carried away. We had a couple of guys on with us that, you know, thought it was Marks and Spencers. And, you know, we're going to open a shop here and we're going to open a shop there. And, and it, it was just horrendous, you know. We, we had these things called managers. And, like, you know, what's that all about? You know, we're, we're all exactly the same. You know, there's some people that, you know, can't, you know, cope with a spanner, but they can sell. So, for me, it, you know, it's all about coming to work, you're spending enough time there. We don't have any managers. We don't have any hierarchy whatsoever. You know, if the boys are going to let me have it, you know, they will do, and rightly so. Um, but it's it's just a nice working environment. You know, it's no no pressure. You know, you start turning around and saying you're more important than this one, and all it does is aggravates people. So you get stuck in as well, mate. You're always on the bikes repairing them. You even cleaned my Canevo for me. Yeah. You know, that was that was pretty nice. So if anyone wants their bike cleaned, you'll you'll do that, right? That was just VIP for you, <laughs> Rob, to be honest. No, I'll be honest with you. I enjoy that side of the business. You know, I can't say that I'm not good at the front, but I'm not a brilliant salesperson. You know, they call me the sales prevention officer. <laughs> Because when people come in and go, you know, what do you think of this, Chris? And I go, oh, I don't think you need it. Well, do you know, I, it's funny because I've talked to you about different bike brands and you sell more than specialised. You sell Orbea, yeah. uh, other brands, yeah. Marin Cube. Scott, yeah. But, but you, you've you got this philosophy that if you don't believe something is good, you won't you won't sell it, even though you sell those brands. So how, how does that fit for you being a bike shop? It's not that I don't think they're good. You know, there's there's lots of uh, good e-bikes out there, but we're about you not being off your bike for more than an hour. That's what it's about. You know, I know that if I was spending that sort of money, I want to be able to be back on that bike on the same day that there's a problem. And as a term man said, it's nothing to do with the manufacturers, you know, 
that are making these bikes, but some of the companies that are providing motors and you know batteries and bits and pieces, they just need to step up and um, you know look at why Specialized are, are, are selling more than you know more than anyone else is because you know it, it's not just Berkshire Cycles. There's you know I've said this before. There's lots of dealers out there that are really you know doing their best to keep the customers and there's a hell of a lot that really are not doing a good job but um you know i think when these motor manufacturers understand what you need to do then i think it would be a game changer so giving you the dealer the ability to do your your internal swap because I think that's what you do with specialized you've got the freedom to... No, no, not, not the freedom. Okay. A lot of uh, uh, other companies out there go, well, it's all right. You know, Berkshire Cycles, they, you know, they get this, they get that. We, we, we don't. We have a good working relationship with Specialized, but we've, you know, we've got probably 200 to 300,000 pounds worth of, you know, components in stock. So we buy all the motors. We buy all the batteries. So, you know, if I put a motor in your bike, um, and Specialized say, no, Rob hasn't cleaned it, hasn't taken it to his local bike shop and serviced it. Um, you know, that, that's, that costs me money. That's, you know, Specialized are not gonna just turn around and go, we'll replace it. The difference is, is that over the time they've learned that what ourselves and, and other people are doing is basically helping the brand, you know. Specialized wouldn't be doing what they're doing if every dealer just turned around and said two or three weeks mate you know because it just put them in the same ballpark as everyone else so yeah it's, it's not if we could go to, to bosch and go right we'll buy 10 motors we'll buy 10 batteries and they or we have the same sort of understanding that we're only trying to you know help bosch or, or uh, shimano or whatever then it would be a game changer. So, you, so that's the difference, I guess. You can then you can right now buy whatever you see fit from the brand. So motors, batteries, and your stock up, mm. because you know as a retailer that you can then get customers riding bikes again within an hour or the same day. But you can't do that with another brand. You can't go and buy them in, and you don't have that same. Not really. You okay. know, you 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 can. You can go and buy a Bosch motor, but again, the, the beauty with with the Specialized is it's such an easy bike to work on. You know, they don't have loads of different harnesses. They don't have loads of different batteries. And that's the thing, you know, like the, the Bosch motor, you know, is fantastic. You know, it's it, that's how I got started on e-bikes. So, I, you know, definitely not gonna knock it. And, you know, their old motor really was like an old tractor. It was, you know, our very first e-bike that we ever had ourselves, we sold it about three or four years later, and um, it come back in last week. And she still got that horrible grinding from the bearings, but you know we can put a new new cover and bearing in it and 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 keep it going. But the, the guy that's got it, he's just absolutely over the moon with it. He's he's you know struggling budget wise, so it's a it's a fantastic bit of kit. So. You know, you can't just turn around and say that motor, that battery and that harness is what we need, you know, because, you know, basically Specialized build the bike and then bros have had to suit the motor around it. It's the other way, you know, Bosch and Shimano give the, the manufacturers the motor and then they've got to build the bike around it. So, which means sometimes they've got longer cables and, you know, shorter cables and the routing is different. So. Yeah. They've even got different charging ports and different kind yeah. of attachments on the bike as well. Okay, yeah. it's really yeah. interesting. I didn't think of it that way. So maybe we'll see that change. Hopefully, I think maybe if bike brands want to be competitive in that kind of space, there might be there might be changes that can be made. Who knows? Well, we, you know, you know yourself, Rob, that everyone is sort of like getting the idea a bit now that e-bikes are going to be here to to stay and seem to be the future. So you've got, you know, people opening lovely showrooms and, you know, coffee shops and, you know, turning around and saying, you know, what we're going to do, Rob, is we're going to do what Chris does at Berkshire Cycles. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. 
And until you turn around and say, so can you change a motor in an hour? Have you got motors here and things like that? And, you know, until that is addressed, until, you know, the manufacturers support the brands more and turn around and say, look, you know, we're going to go with it. Yeah, I think they're still at, they're still at the front at the moment. Mm. Interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, it's still quite early days, really, in the whole e-bike world, isn't it? I know they've been around for yeah. some time, but... I would say the past 12 months has been a, there's been an explosion of e-bikes and, and like you say specialized i think were really at the forefront of the integration and the way that the bikes looked and a lot of e-bikes were quite bulbous they had the external batteries and now they're starting to get to a point where everyone wants an e-bike now because they they look good they ride well all the people that i'm speaking to out on the trails their next purchase is an e-bike. The kids want an e-bike. Everyone wants e-bikes now. So it's getting to this point where, well, obviously for you, they sell way more than regular bikes, but... Not necessarily, you know, obviously you still got the, you know, the everyday market, but it's... The e-bike is, is definitely the future and the way that it's going, but... You know, I watch a, a few of your reviews and, and and sit there and, you know, you talk about price and, you know, and so on. And, you know, I'm getting people saying to me, yeah, I specialise of, you know, they've priced themselves out of the market. Well, specialised don't sit there and just go, right, we're having it away. So what we're going to do is just going to put all the bikes up and it's going to be take it or leave it. It's done for reasons. And the reasons are, you know, Two years ago, Specialized didn't actually put their prices up when the euro and the dollar were sort of like, you know, in trouble with the pound and everything else. You know, they, they had bought their currency and, and decided that it was only fair that they were new into the to the e-bike market, so they wanted to try and keep it nice and, you know, straightforward. And, and no one moaned about them not putting their bikes up. But now, you know, this year they've had two price increases, which is, is not good. But I know that, you know, Specialized are big enough to buy their currency, to be able to forecast what they're going to do and so on. But in this crazy time now, you, you know, everyone's having to pay a premium. You know, even, even the boats being unloaded, you know, it's sort of like, well, mate, you know, if you, if you want your container, we're going to have to bring a few more bo boys in, you know, it's going to cost you a few, a few more quid. And that's where it's, you know, it's really difficult and, you know, on some of your reviews where, you, you know, you're looking at, you know, one of one of the reviews I watched was a sort of like sub four grand e-bike and uh, you, you've brought it into me and I've seen it and everything else and it's great, but they haven't got the distribution over here. It's just something that they've gone to the factory, had it in and, and so on. And it's great, you need that, but that does create lots of other problems, you know. How can you get a bike better in technology, you know, with better components if you're just trying to squash the price? So as long as, the, you know, it's capped somewhere along the line, I would like to see a bike that was dual purpose, you know, that you didn't need to have maybe a big hit Canevo and a Levo, something that you could sort of like go, this is my e-bike and I know that it's good, I know it's going to be reliable and I'm going to be able to keep it for two or three years. That's the sort of thing that I would like to see. Mm. So, but yeah, I think it's exciting times for a lot yeah. of the manufacturers. Yeah. I think the thing on pricing is, I think it frustrates people because they want an e-bike and they are, they are a lot of money. You know, you get a lot out of them if you use them every weekend and, and evenings and the long summers, it, you know, you can ride till half nine, 10 o'clock at night because you've got the assistance. And I think a lot of people really, really want an e-bike and they, they, they haven't got the funds maybe. And especially in the time that we're in, it's a little bit, you know, people are a bit concerned with, with spend, but I think all e-bike prices are going up. From what I've seen, even the direct consumer brands, they've gone up by like 10, 12% and they're still, you know, four, five, six thousand pounds. So, I don't think it's going to be as as wide as as what we've seen, and I think that that bike that we're talking about, that decathlon, sold out. It was almost like they only had a couple of hundred of them, and yeah. it was just this maybe a loss leader. Even it might have been yeah. something like that. So, but it worked. Yeah, you know, it got bums on seats, and 
you know, the good thing is, is then people ride something that, you know, it maybe is a little bit plusher or a, a bit nicer to ride. So it's brought them into it. So there's, there's always going to be a market. But, you know, it wasn't that long ago where we sort of, if we go back, what, three, four years ago is when we sort of really got into the specialised e-bike. Now, remember, they had this green, Kawasaki green Levo, the Gen 1. Lovely looking bike, huge tyres on it. And we were selling it for, I don't know, three grand, three and a half grand. And now you see them up for sale for 2,900, three grand. You know, my nephew, one of his Christmas presents from his mum was a, a Gen 1 Levo. And, um, yeah, he had the bike two years and ended up making about, a, you know, 1,500 quid profit on it. <laughs> You know, and that's, uh, what else can you buy that is giving you that return? So yeah. it's, you know, when you, when you look at, a, you know, price of a motorbike now, an off-road motorbike, and then you look at, a, you know, an S-Works, it's very similar. The only well, difference it's one is, of the most commented things on, on my channel. Yeah. When people that, I guess, are more casual viewers, they watch it and they, they, they then see the price and they compare it to something established like a motorcycle yeah. that's been around 100 plus years and there's yeah. all the design and R&D and all that capital expenditure sunk in that many, yeah. many years ago. We're now at the e-bike market where it's innovating at such a rapid pace that there is an associated cost to that. Yeah, you know, I had this conversation the other week with a, with a guy, you know, he just bought, a, you know, a, a CRF 250 or something, and it was, you know, around about eight, nine grand. And he said, God, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm paying nearly that for my e-bike. And I said, the only difference is, you don't need to put your e-bike in a van to go anywhere. You're not going to have a load of hassle. It costs you like 100 quid each time to use a, a, yeah, a crosser, it, doesn't it? Over here now, you know, it's all gone berserk, in it? You know, you can't go out in the country and ride your motocross bike because someone from the city, you know, has bought, the, you know, the local farm and doesn't want people running around. And, you know, I, I've been around motocross since 1972 and, you know, the way that things have changed, you know, especially this year with the, you know, the races being uh, cancelled, you know, motocross meetings and the World Championship, it's costing us 200 grand to go and race a motorbike or we can do 10,000 quid and, and have just as much fun with no pressure of I've got to win or I've got to do this. So, yes, it, 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 it's good. It's a new thing coming along and, and you know, You'll always have to do good as are going to be complaining about your e-bikes. But again, as you know, that's changed. You know, in the early days, you know, everyone thought you were cheating on the wife because every time you went past someone, they would call you a cheater. <laughs> you know, it took me ages to realise it was because I was on an electric bike. <laughs> but, um, you know, that's all changed now, isn't it? You know, people are they're not saying that you're cheating now. They're actually turning around and saying, can I have a go? Yeah. So. Yeah, well, that looks cool. Give me a toe yeah. is what, what we hear. Should we have a chat to some of your staff? Yeah. What's it like working here? I love it. Do it's you? the best thing ever. Just everyone here, like the environment, everything. It's just lovely. What's Chris like as a boss? The best boss ever. Well, you've got to yeah, say that. Have. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is the best thing about working here then? Um, I like what we sell. Like I love the e-bike sort of things. So selling Levos, Kinevos that's sort of my area like turbo area so and you've just started racing as well haven't you yeah pedal hound so i've done two of them what was it like scary um but yeah really good i loved it yeah it's really good because uh yeah i know more um girls who want to do it inspired by you as well so. yeah there was nine or ten women that did it last time i think it's like where women customers come in here and then sort of start talking to like me or joanna like who's obviously experienced it. And then I think that's where they are like, oh, I want to give that a go. Like every lever I sell to a woman, it's not obviously as frequent as it would be to like a gent. Um, but yeah, I say you should come along. It's like a really good experience. It's really relaxed, which is nice as well. Yeah. And massive congratulations for your award, yes. which is pretty. Yeah, we were all over the moon with the award. It was just the best thing ever to get that after this year, which was really nice. And Chris was over the moon as well with everyone. But yeah, it was everyone that was obviously awarded it, so. How's it been over the summer? Like, has it been? Stressful, obviously I'm still at college, so I have that and also was working here, but it was 
like the best experience ever, like the queues and everything. It was just like the most weirdest feeling, but it was like the best thing ever, like running up and down the shop to get the card machine and like the repairs and stuff. We're selling like probably 17 to 30 bikes a day. That was like per every person. So it was just crazy, yeah. Amazing. How long have you been here for? A long time. <laughs> we won't ask then. I've but... lie about my age. <laughs> 21 years I've worked for Butch Cycles. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. Like It's gone in a flash though, that's the sad thing. Massive congratulations. Thank you. For your award. What was it like to first of all be nominated for it and then actually win it? It was amazing because we all have had a really tough year, as everyone knows, and when we got put forward as a nomination, we were like, oh, wow, that's amazing, like quite an achievement. You know, the shop's been around for a long time, but we didn't ever get put forward for anything like that. So when we found out, that was good. And then when we found out that we'd won, none of us could believe it. So, yeah, we're all chuffed, chuffed to bits. It's, it's a nice end to, like, a really difficult year. The best thing about Chris... Oh, that's a good question. <laughs> um... I don't know, he's a good boss to work for. Yeah. We, we've all worked for him for a long time. If he wasn't fair and decent, then we wouldn't all still be here. So he's yeah. all right. He's all right, isn't okay. he? Yeah. he? From what I see, he gets stuck in as well. I often see him in yeah, the shop with like, you know, repairing stuff yeah. and gets on well with the team and everyone really respects him as yeah, well. Yeah, we do. And Chris has always said, I would never ask anyone to do anything that he wouldn't be prepared to do himself. So I think that's quite good. It's not like he just sits in an office controlling everyone. He is there at the floor and you kind of just take the lead from Chris really. Yeah. So we're kind of at the end of what seems like lockdown, but who knows what's going to happen? Like what, what do you think is going to happen over the next six months or a year in, in bikes and e-bikes? I think it's going to get tricky again because stock, I think we're, it's a little bit limited at what's available at the moment. There's stuff coming through. So I think it's a bit of a bottleneck. I think it will open up a, a bit in the new year and then I think it will get difficult again. Um, I think, yeah, we're going to have another wave of difficulty, I think. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see what happens with, with stock and new yeah. bikes and the demand because it just went off the chart, didn't it? You've been having phone calls all throughout the, oh, the yeah. year. On, and we've on... got so much stuff that's already pre-sold. So you're still eagerly awaiting all of that. You're getting calls from customers and you can't quite give them an exact date of when it's coming. We know stuff will be in the new year, but it will just be a day or two before it comes that we know what's coming yeah but any new orders could be anywhere between may to august next year it's incredible isn't it so if you see a bike that you want this one's quite nice this isn't is it nice the color on it. that yeah. well i like the way that you just get people to go out the back like yeah. do you know what i mean by that you you kind of invite people to go out to the, the workshop when when it's appropriate to do so and in lockdown yeah. it might be a little bit different but you get to see almost like behind the scenes because out yeah. here it looks really, you know, lovely and, yeah. and bike shoppy. But it feels a bit like old school in a good way. Yeah. When you go out and you see all the all the people working on the bikes and stuff. So yeah. I don't know if you get that everywhere. Maybe you do, but I don't know. Yeah, probably I wouldn't know how much. I mean, we've always been like that, so I don't think we'll change in that sense of like if if we want something to know a little bit more about their bike or if they want to learn a bit more, then we'll be like, oh yeah, just come through. So it is quite relaxed. So we'll always have that, I think. Congratulations, not just for, for you, but congratulations to you boys as well for your award, winning uh, number one bike shop in the UK, which has been pretty epic. Obviously you say it's down to you. Well, I've been in a year, you know, <laughs> so we won nothing before. <laughs> it can't just be coincidence. <laughs> I'm Steve. Hi, it's Ben Riley. What's your name? Uh, my name is Joanna. How's it going? Oh, good. Thank What's you. it like working at Berkshire Cycles and with these guys? Crazy. Is it? <laughs> yeah. What's the best thing about it? He's put his hands up over there. <laughs> All of them, yeah, guys. Roll on 2021. Yeah, man. No, uh, it's, um, it's nice that people have took the time to actually go and vote because, believe it or not, you actually get used to good service and when that's when they're actually going out there and sort of thanking you for it, it's, uh, it's nice to see. How many votes did you put in yourself? Uh, I didn't vote. Did you not? Well, I did, but for treads. <laughs> <laughs> and what's it like working with these boys then? It's a punishment. <laughs> it is, I don't really know what I've done to deserve it, but I, you know, I'll stick with them. Gary? Gary, yeah? Is it true that you are 10 times 
British sidecar champion. It's very true, yes. Well done, mate. That Thank sounds amazing. Much. So how long were you sidecar in for? Probably about 30 years. Did you race with Chris? Yes. Okay. Yeah, on a number of occasions. We won the support championship and the four-stroke championship as well. So uh, I know him very well. Yeah. You got any secrets you can tell us about him? Uh, not on film, no. <laughs> <laughs> What's it like working with this mate here? Well, the problem is, is I'm the eldest, I'm the shortest, so I have the butt end of every bit of banter as it comes across. But uh, I've got broad shoulders. And who have we got over here? Hold on, there's someone hiding in the corner. You're not, by the way, I should introduce you. That, yep. That's not your real name, is it? No. What's, do you not call yourself by your real name? Is it no. secret? Okay. So what's it like working with this team of people? Oh, they're the best bunch of people you could ever work with. Chris is the best boss. Just a good company. Got any uh, any stories that you can share on no. the film? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> Thank you to everyone that voted for us. Yeah, I think it's, it's a pleasure. But it's testament to you guys, and you know, I think that you've worked like many people in the cycling industry. You've worked your butts off, but you guys are always trying to go above and beyond. And yeah, but it's just what you enjoy, isn't it? If work's enjoyable, you don't mind doing it. Exactly. Good. 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 <laughs> Congratulations, mate. Cheers.